Folks, thanks for coming along tonight on a cold evening and welcome to all our people on the Zoom call, uh, some of whom are in Sydney, some, many of whom are not, uh, for this discussion around the launch of the Boxing Butterfly, A Life of Conviction, uh, Margaret Canine's biography introduced and edited by Andrew Irvin. So we've got Andrew here, we've got Margaret here, they're both well known, I'll introduce them very briefly. Margaret Canine is C. Barrister and author of The Boxing Butterfly, uh, Andrew L. Irvin, a journalist and an author. He's the editor of The Boxing Butterfly, and we've got copies of that for sale tonight. But he's also recently co-authored Zelensky, The Unlikely Ukrainian Hero. But tonight we're talking about the Sydney hero, not the Ukrainian hero. And we'll lead off with um, Andrew, talk, Andrew Irvin talking to Margaret Kinney. Thank you. And Hello, Margaret. Good evening, Andrew, and good evening. Thank you for paying us the honour of being here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Look, I thought it would be uh, a good idea to start with a little context. Why am I here? Uh, I'm a journalist, and I've been for 25 years or so a film journalist and critic. So why am I here? How did I get to be here, standing next to Margaret? The story is simple. I always thought, as a journalist in the film industry, that... F the films can change your life. And then it happened to me. There was a documentary made in 2013 by Melbourne filmmaker Eve Ash about the police investigation into the disappearance of Bob Chappell in Hobart. And <clears throat> the, the investigation in the film was about the police investigation into his partner of 18 years, Sue Neil Fraser, who was charged and convicted of his murder. The case is a clear case of a miscarriage of justice and it really hooked me. And from there on, uh, I became not a film journalist, but <laughs> a crusading justice journalist, if you like. Uh, I have since covered many other cases, unfortunately. Now, where this leads to is that I then, about five years later, published a book of my work called Murder by the Prosecution. And, <laughs> and I dared to ask Margaret to write the foreword and she very kindly agreed. And then a little later, I asked her to work with me on a book about her. So that's where we came together and that's how we end up here talking about the boxing butterfly. So let me begin, if I may, by <coughs> transgressing, uh, tr transfer. <laughs> <laughs> we won't have any of that, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe later. <laughs> you were forgiven. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as you will find if you read the book, um, there are sections in it which deal not with Margaret's successes, but her low points. And one of them, Curiously enough, was also a high point, and that was her now infamous and then uh, applauded speech to Newcastle University law students in 20, uh, 2005. 2005, yes. The speech became infamous, and we'll talk about why. But what I'd like to ask you, Margaret, first is, you ended the speech with a wonderful admonishment to students, as lawyers you have power, be good with it. Can you explain what you meant? Yes, I, I was then a Crown Prosecutor and had been for many years, and I remained a Crown Prosecutor for 14 years after that. But I had seen that in partic particularly in the sexual assault sphere, there were, was a, uh, a tendency or, or, um, by, by defence counsel to, to engage in a war of attrition against the complainant or complainants and to take every point, to take every appeal, to, to uh, keep coming back, uh, to, to stretch it all out so that in the end uh, s someone got defeated. It was just too hard to keep coming back after appeals and, and separation of trials and so forth. 
And, and so I wasn't saying anything about uh, the, str the strength of the cases necessarily, but that, uh, that, that they should be considering the, those people, the complainants in sexual assault, in, in a, a good way. And isn't it extraordinary? Um, I, I find myself always on the wrong side of, of fashion, perhaps, in these areas, because when I first started out in uh, prosecuting child sexual assault cases in the mid-'80s, and that was about all I did, uh, myself and a number of women and a couple of men, uh, and and we were regarded pretty much as the women's auxiliary to the d department to the, to the director of public prosecutions office, and people uh, other people um, men probably kept saying to us uh, in the office, "Are you still doing those kiddie sex cases?" And it was very pejoratively looked upon uh, as as something that wasn't quite crime. It wasn't bank robberies and murders. It was, it, it was probably a, a bunch of lies thought up by women and children. And uh, so, so we, and, and, but it was a different style of um, offence in those days because so much of it was uh, in the family. That, that, was, that was the stuff that was coming out then uh, in the family and, and perhaps a bit in community groups or even uh, gradually in some uh, church groups. But but it was uh, it, what well, was incest cases by and large, and that there were it was enormous, but it wasn't really believed, and and magistrates would throw it out. In fact, the whole area wasn't believed much until I prosecuted the noted pedophile Dolly Dunn in the late 1990s, and uh, I, I knew that it had to be proven to most of the community that there was such a thing as pedophilia. Because I, I knew my parents, for example, just said, oh, well, no men are going to be interested in children. It's just impossible. And they they, partic they just couldn't believe it. And, and, and they thought, I, I think my father thought my work was stupid too, uh, you know, a lot of it. And, and uh, so I was appearing before a judge with Michael Fernane, and he, I said, you've, you've got to sit, Your Honour, and the plenty of press there, you have got to watch. He's, he's videoed this stuff. You have got to watch it. No, I'm not watching it. You can describe it to me in words, can't you? And I said, oh, I can't. You must have a look at it, some of this stuff so that you know. And But what I really wanted was for the many members of the press to put it out there that, that this stuff does happen. And and not, not only does it happen, but... The little children are inured to it, which you you could plainly see on some of these videos. How they were so used to it that to wave a, a twenty dollar note in front of and this is going back a long time in front of their faces, they just um, themselves took down their pants and so forth. And so so that was something that had to be communicated to the public because they they weren't they didn't understand it. Uh, but uh, so, but but I was very unpopular for this area of uh, prosecutions, and uh, it could, because it wasn't the fashion yet, and it had to be, um, it had to be taken up by others to become the fashion. And and f and while it wasn't fashionable, I was criticised so much for any any expression of uh, even supporting the fortitude. Of, of a complainant without saying anything about uh, the strength of the case or the merits of the case. And so, so uh, uh, when one compares what not only what has recently been said by uh, one of the celebrities in the press at the moment, but, but even going back to um, a particular royal commission, uh, the, some, of the, um, some of the blanket statements about uh, how people and, and how many priests were guilty. Uh, it, it, for, forget the fact, forget fair trials, forget um, the presumption of innocence, or uh, forget due process. Uh, so, so I've, and now, now I'm a defence counsel, and not not so much. Um, I, I expected after so many years as a crown prosecutor that the New South Wales DPP might do itself a favour and sometimes brief me in trials. Well, uh, my, my accountant's glad that they never did, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, they never did. They never did. 
And uh, so I'm now a, a, entirely a defence counsel and, and now um, it's, oh, how terrible of me to represent uh, these people. But it's, it's a different, the, most people I represent now, the sexual assault area that's burgeoning is uh, what you could call date rape. And so there's, there's dozens, hundreds, uh, it, it's half, half the cases in the district court at the moment, young men, young or uh, even up to middle-aged men, uh, who have got, had a date with a young woman or, or gone out with her or ended up drunk with her, and, and uh, then it's maybe days or years later uh, that it's, this complaint is raised. And, and only today, well, perhaps I shouldn't talk about today, but uh, because it's not finished yet, but for example, if, if a man says in court, well, actually it wasn't a matter of consent because she was the initiator all the way through. Oh, so you're the victim then, are you? Oh, objection. Why, why is it now that the prosecuting authorities have to find a victim in any uh, sexual situation? But, but that seems to be the way it's going now. And uh, what what a my, my whole career seems to have been the progression of uh, sexual assault cases and and how, uh, but in the book brings this out a bit because, gosh, I was flogged for giving a giving a a, a, a lecture a distinguished lecture which included because well, one of the only things that the students wanted to know about was why were all these cases limping on all the. SCAF gang rape cases. I never mentioned the, the name SCAF, let alone the real name of a man called MG. But uh, his lawyers used the lecture to have me taken off the uh, the retrial, a retrial because because oh someone on someone in the audience at the University of Newcastle might have some connection to some jury in the future, oh. and and so, and the the court constituted in a particular way, was very happy to, to write uh, what some may think is a very agenda-driven judgment, MG against R something in 2007, two years after the lecture, uh, which took me off the case. And Charles, Charles, Charles Waterstreet was the, was the counsel who took it, instructed by Chris Murphy, and he wrote me, a, he wrote me a, an email the other day and he said, oh, congratulations on your book. MG and I still thank you for that lecture <laughs> uh, because I was taken off and couldn't couldn't appear in the case and an another prosecutor was appointed. Uh, the complainant had no relationship with that person, didn't want to come back and the case was lost. MG didn't get out of jail because he was in in there for all the other rapes that he had committed. So, so, uh, so be, be good with it, um, you know, just just be fair. And sometimes, and I know this now, in my fourth year as a defence counsel, sometimes you've just got to plead these people guilty. And, and you can do a, a strong case for them on, uh, on, on sentence, but some, some people really... Uh, so, I, so I've remained the same. I, I haven't really changed that much, but uh, the cases that are now being prosecuted have changed enormously. And a, a, a Crown Prosecutor has the duty to look to see whether uh, there, there is really a case to go to, the, to a court. As I told the Royal Commissioner in the, uh, <clears throat> that Royal Commission, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, when I recommended, I, I could, because I was taken before that Royal Commission uh, after I'd done a commission of inquiry of my own, uh, concerning uh, certain clerics in the Newcastle area. Uh, but the minute that was finished, I was to be uh, torn to shreds or well, attempts were made to tear me to shreds for having uh, years before written an advice to the, to the Director of Public Prosecutions in Queensland. It wasn't, it wasn't a case of me getting out of work or something that I might have had to do. And I just said there's no reasonable prospect of conviction in relation to some noted case in Queensland. And um, so I was, I was dragged into that Royal Commission and treated as though I was a cover-upper of child sexual assault because of that advice. And, and as I had to apprise the Commissioner and uh, uh, those assisting him, it's not, it wasn't my belief in the, it, it, it's not a matter of whether the prosecutor believes the complainant. 
It, it's a matter of whether there's enough evidence to put before a court. And, and it, it was somewhat prescient if one considers what happened to poor Cardinal Pell. Yeah, I mean, it's bizarre that that speech uh, is now referred to by many uh, lawyers as a significant and wonderful lecture, uh, and yet it led to one of the worst lows in your career. But there was another one, wasn't there, that was even worse in some respects. I'm sure that you will all remember how uh, the Independent Commission Against Corruption targeted Margaret um, but the book goes into detail that you are probably not aware of because very few people are, apart from a very small circle around Margaret. That was, in a way, uh, a, 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 an attack on her career and character without any ground at all. But it didn't seem like that. What, what was the first thing that you knew about it? That was funny timing too, because it happened straight after I'd been to said Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, the worst thing that happened to me probably was that a rumour went around mm -hmm. while I was doing the Commission of Inquiry in Newcastle that I may be appointed uh, to the Supreme Court. And it was, it was uh, considered that the government was the right one for me, uh, as it were. So, so there was a two-pronged a two attack, but I think the same people were behind it, pretty much, or the same two people. Anyway, uh, I, I've told you about the first one, and, and as soon as I got out of that, uh, my, my house and my son's house was raided without warrants by this, uh, this, un un uh, this band of... This uh, band of uh, unlawful members of the executive government uh, and um, all, all they had to have done I hadn't I wasn't in this car accident my son wasn't in it either and, and there was absolutely no communication between me and the sober girl driving the car but um, all, all the all ICAC had to do a pretty easy investigation was ask the police whether her blood was taken when she was taken to the hospital, because uh, it, of course it was, and she, there's there's no alcohol in it. So and so it was all a complete completely misconceived. But I I Just think they knew that. I, I mean it, that didn't matter, you see, because you all you have to do is throw the mud, uh, throw it up in the air, and you know that nothing will be resolved for years, and the the, the target will be destroyed. Now why why did the um, come to your house. What was the precept? Well, they the wanted, pretext, they, wanted they wanted uh, phones, and they they took well they took they took some of some of the phones, but um, there's always more phones. Uh, <laughs> but um, they, because they, they believed what? Because they they were looking for some evidence that I had told the girl to to fake chest pains after a car accident, but. It, it, it wasn't the, it wasn't a, um, a breath test thing because it was such a bad car accident that she was taken straight away by the ambulance be, well before my son even got there. So, and by that that time her blood was taken. But ICAC told the inspector when it was later investigated by him of his own motion, uh, a, a wonderful man now deceased, God rest his soul, uh, Justice David Levine, and thank thank God for him because he he just knew it, he smelled a rat. And um, but <clears throat> um, he found out that they they didn't really know what they were looking for. Uh, in fact, and I, I kind of knew that too because at one stage before they had crystallised their allegation, they asked me for uh, my government e tag, and and I uh, and I said I haven't got a government e tag. Oh well, what what about the e tag that was on the car that was being driven by the son's girlfriend? And 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 I said well. She was travelling north over the Harbour Bridge. So how's that? Uh, how's that going? Uh, I, I said. I said. I can remember it so specifically. I said, "You don't incur a toll going north." And it was an Englishman speaking to me, and he said, "Do you not?" <laughs> and, and, and I said, "No." no. I said, Gee, you blokes are amazing. So it took them ages to work out what the what the complaint was. But, I'm but sorry. can I, I? I'm particularly. I I, I think that. Um, our audience would really love to know what it was 
that triggered this hunt for you? Oh, yeah. What, what was the phone call? Oh, yes. Well, so at the, uh, I think a, a few days later, because it was a card that my kids used but happened to be in my name. Um, and so so I, the, I knew the, um, the smash repairer uh, because, because one of my sons works in, in that industry and, and I had a beer with him down the pub. Uh, so some, some journalists in the Sydney Morning Herald think that I don't hang out with anyone other than work. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true pretty much. <laughs> uh, and, and anyone with any, any sense would do the same thing. But uh, so I knew this, this fellow from down there. And uh, so he, he spoke, but he, he spoke to me on the tow truck driver's phone because the tow truck driver had taken my number. The tow truck driver was under investigation by uh, by the Australian something or crime other, whatever commission. it is, Crime Commission, uh, for some kind of drug dealing. And uh, so they were listening to my phone and and um, t the, the smash repairer asked me something about the young lady's chest because she'd recently had it operated on for the purposes of making it bigger. <laughs> and, and, and it was about, it, it was, conversation around that that we were talking about fake chest and oh, what did she go to hospital for chest pains and he was laughing and and so it came from that uh, but ICAC of course is notoriously uh, lacking in levity or sense of humour <laughs> and, and didn't get it at all in fact when it went to the parliamentary committee the only person who, or one of the, the people, po few politicians who stood up for me was Reverend Fred Nile and he said I, he said look I get it, I, and I know Margaret, and that's how she speaks, and I understand her perfectly. And this is a joke. Uh, this is a joke, and 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 what what a wonderful and brave man he was to is a still, but to to do that for me. So what does it tell you that the agency who's charged with uh, rooting out corruption acts on a secret phone conversation that? wasn't supposed to include you about a joke with a tow truck operator, uh, a smash repairer. About a sober driver. About a sober driver and unleashes its entire uh, aggressive force against you. What does it say about that sort of organisation? If I can uh, avoid uh, asking you that question, that's just a rhetorical question, but I would like to... <laughs> I might <laughs> accidentally answer it. <laughs> I would like to say that as a footnote to that story, um, you know that Margaret was not only cleared, but ICAC was thoroughly slapped around for the way they behaved. ICAC hasn't apologised. Has never apologised to anybody. My husband, Which, Greg, sorry, went no. before the parliamentary committee um, into ICAC and just asked for that, just said, said, because, in fact, had it not been my case, no one would have ever... Because mine was very simple. Anyone can understand that. And, but everyone else's ICAC case is very, very complicated. And it's, it's, in, it's almost impossible for even smart people who are interested to, to understand it all. Uh, but uh, mine was so simple. And, and there, I, I know that Chris Merritt from The Australian has said to me many times since, I thought they must be doing it all OK until you... And and anyone could see that. So so we so Greg went along and asked for a, for an apology, and uh, that then there was a big report. And no, we're not going to do that. So that was the current parliamentary committee. So uh, it's so I'm pretty annoyed and uh, but not surprised. The corporate culture of arrogance. Now it, this is a nice segue into the subject which is currently being debated hotly around the country, namely a federal ICAC. <laughs> you, you gave some uh, advice to then Attorney General Christian Porter about the subject a couple of years ago. Mm. And what advice another, did another you terrible give? story, yeah. isn't it? Mm. Um, harking back to my first uh, chapter or, uh, of this talk. But yes, uh, I, well, you can't have a body that chooses its own targets. When it's full of public servants of of the same mind, and uh, it, you know it's, it, it may not matter much. I, I bet it doesn't really happen now because of, there's a change of government, and 
anyone must be able to see the uh, political assassination uh, agenda of, the, of these bodies. But, but they can't be permitted to, to choose their own targets, just as a policeman doesn't choose his own target, just as a royal commission doesn't choose its own target. Uh, someone else ought to say this should be investigated. And the second thing of, is, of course, uh, what's happened to the presumption of innocence? The, what, what is the matter with these people that they are so into self-aggrandisement that they can't wait till the end of the judicial process before they take the credit for the investigation? As detectives have always done, they can wait. They don't want... They don't want the public and the presses looking into their investigations while they're on foot. Nothing could be uh, less uh, likely to assist. So, so that, 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 that's two things, two obvious things. But there is one thing I'd like to draw you on before we finish, and that is uh, the rationale that you put in an article that uh, I requested you to write, which was why a federal ICAC is not likely to be particularly useful uh, as opposed to ICACs in the, in the lower um, governments? Well, already there are about, I think, 11 bodies in, in the federal sphere that look to, uh, to corruption in various areas for the police and, uh, and, and other types of areas, the ombudsman and, and, and many, many. But the higher in government one goes, the more layers there are. It's almost important. And, and the less money, yeah, cash money and so forth that gets taken. There, there are just so many levels of, of uh, decision making. And so I see that the New South Wales ICAC is back looking at local councils, where it belongs probably. Because uh, maybe there's still something to see there, but not not, not uh, very rarely in the New South Wales or in state governments, but even much more rarely in in federal governments. Then again, let's see what happens in the next few years. Okay, thank you very much, Margaret. Um, so many thanks to um, Margaret Canine and Andrew Urban for. A fine presentation so far. We're coming up to questions and discussion. I should remind you, we've got copies of Margaret's book. Um, the Boxing Butterfly, A Life of Conviction. And uh, we've got copies of that. And I'm sure, for sale, I'm sure Margaret and Andrew will be happy to sign it. After, so if you both come up this side and that side, I'll take that microphone. Margaret, you come where you were. Yes, thank you. And I think if we just start off with a question to both of you, we'll start with Margaret. Um, the meaning of the boxer, the boxing butterfly. I'm a boxer for sport, and the butterfly reference may have something that it was thought up by Andrew, uh, who I've I've neglected to thank. Thank you, Andrew, for forcing me to to write these things. But would you explain what the butterfly means? Because I forget. Yes. Well, <laughs> you just come this way towards the microphone. Yes. Yes. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, as soon as we started work on this and. I was aware of the phrase that uh, has been quoted by then Commissioner of ICAC, Megan Latham, who advised lawyers that perhaps they should come and work at ICAC because it was like pulling wings off butterflies. Mm -hmm. And I thought the fact that Margaret was a boxer mm -hmm. seemed, <laughs> it seemed appropriate that considering how she um, battled against ICAC and won, uh, the boxing butterfly was a good image. Does she sting like a bee? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> the double meaning. Um, so just before we go, well, there's a question here. Just before we do, how did you put the book together? I mean, you're the editor. It's all your work of speeches and other speeches and, and opinions and whatever else. So how did you work together on it? Well, the first thing that happened was that um, I took uh, lawful, lawful custody of several boxes of transcripts and letters and papers and magazine articles and cards that Margaret had accumulated over the years. She never threw anything out. Um, so I moved out of home and put the boxes there <laughs> and then <laughs> came the task of going through it, you know, and selecting what we were going to uh, use. There's so much material, so it was really a matter of discussing what what we should include. And my uh, my aim was always to let her voice come through because she had written a lot of uh, 
articles for magazines and newspapers, as well as having had a lot of articles written about her. So those two formed kind of the bulk, except I asked Margaret if she would um, write kind of personal uh, recollections of a number of milestone cases, uh, not, not legalistic, but very personal. And I think they make some of the best reading in the book. Uh, very approachable. Some of them are quite funny. Uh, some of them are funny in a black way. Uh, and so it became a process of gathering her words already uh, written. And then we added, of course, we added, uh, I didn't ask her to write the ICAC Bart chapter. <laughs> I wrote the introduction and uh, it came together as a chronicle. I called it a chronicle because it just chronicled her career. The wonderful thing is, uh, well, if I can take some credit for being so lazy and slow on it, uh, because, because I, I thought that I might have a bit of time after I retired from from being a Crown Prosecutor at the beginning of 2019, but then I got so many briefs in for the defence, which has been very rewarding indeed. But uh, as as a, a judge said to me the other day, isn't it amazing how terrible all the people that you prosecuted were, but what paragons of virtue everyone that you represent are. And, but, uh, and it, but it, although, as I've said, it's not just me who's changed, but I, I, have, um, I have been proud to represent people who've been rightly uh, acquitted, quite a few of them uh, since. And um, so, so the, the book has the benefit of a balance between prosecution cases and defence cases that it wouldn't have had had I had I been on my game and and um, doing everything as quickly as, as Andrew I, I'm sure originally hoped. So it's better for the for the three or four years that it's taken. Definitely. There's a question, and and there's a question here. Thank you. Um, forgive me. I read your book, so I don't know, this is covered it's slightly off what you've been talking about, but you are Margaret Kinneen. Has Margaret Kinneen got any thoughts on how uh, large sections, maybe large sections of the media, could be got to understand and comply with sub judice? Oh. <laughs> it's, it looks to be worse than ever now, unless... Uh, certain action is taken. Uh, I, I, I don't really know because, unfortunately, even uh, large slabs of the legal profession seem to have the view that uh, people in certain crimes, certain fashionable crimes, we can abandon the uh, pretense at the, at the uh, burden of proof and, and, and just fight and call everyone victims from the start. And th this is really happening mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, prosecutors are doing it um, uh, so and so it can't be surprising that members of the, the media are doing it too uh, as though certain people uh, or people accused of certain crimes don't even deserve um, a, a, a fair trial I, I don't know how to how to fix uh, fix the, the journalists because I can't even fix the lawyers uh, <laughs> There's a question here. <clears throat> this is a question to both of you. Andrew, you as a journalist and you as a lawyer. Uh, ICAC was renowned in New South Wales for leaking a lot of information, confidential information, to one particular <coughs> investigative journalist who ran this material in the newspaper, <coughs> the Zulu Morning Herald, with no action being taken against them. Uh, to what extent, A, Andrew, is this ethical and proper journalism? And B, to you, why wasn't action taken against them? Well, I can answer that in one word. No, it isn't ethical. I think it's not ethical on the part of ICAC to do that. That's, that's totally contrary to their charter, to the very notion of justice. But then don't forget ICAC doesn't operate like a... A court. It's not like a criminal court. It doesn't have anything like the same kind of protections for its victims. And it's all, always on a quest to increase its funding. So it wants to show the public 
uh, what it's doing and, and who it's after. And it's, it's better to do that before, <laughs> before the, the case is finished because they generally lose the cases. I mean, who can think of anyone else besides Mr Obeid and Mr McDonald uh, who has actually gone the distance? <clears throat> and prob uh, probably uh, <clears throat> they would have been found out by some other body anyway uh, if, if they're guilty. But uh, so, so th that they do leak, t and, and it, not only do they leak, it was a bit of a two-way thing because, excuse me, <clears throat> sometimes that same uh, newspaper could, could commence uh, ICAC's interest in a particular investigation, could run a story and then it would be taken up. That was in that particular regime covering two commissioners, which is now ended. Um, so, so it was, but, but, and, and we know that there was a council assisting who used to brief uh, the, the paper every day and, and promise them headlines the next day and, and line up the witnesses just for that. So it, it was all about uh, public, uh, public uh, aggrandisement of what ICAC was doing. And, and, that, and that scalp uh, seeking was, was a very, very unfortunate because they probably missed any any corruption that was happening if it was just um, Joe Blow from the Public Works Department because that's that 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 would be on page forty six if, if if in the paper at all. But, but was it illegal and were there any restrictions? Oh well, I I did, that happened to me too because when when things were shut down they still wanted to let stuff out like all my text messages to, and I think that's the reason I never got any briefs from the DPP. They even uh, they let out text messages that I'd written about my boss uh, nine years before when he was, uh, well, not doing very well in an appeal against a triple murderer that I'd successfully prosecuted and it was obvious it was going to. I, I wasn't, I, so I just, it was a pretty uh, short text message and uh, pretty to the point and not, but not very decent, uh, not, and I better not repeat it. But um, he, of course, that was to that was designed after ICAC was defeated to make sure my career was harmed. What, what was left of it. So, uh, so, so, but there was no. no well, the, the inspector said it was horrendous. The inspector, but but if the inspector says stuff that says anything about ICAC, nothing ever happens. The parliamentary committee look at it and then a few members on a particular party uh, expurgate uh, all the recommendations. This happened only recently, in this, this year. Um, and, and the recommendations were cut down to nothing. So, so there's, n there's no stopping them. Uh, I, You'll enjoy reading the, uh, in, the in inspector's report on ICAC, I'm sure. Um, I, I wasn't fully aware that uh, you, your husband had sought an apology on your behalf. Uh, and, and for him and my family. And, and for everybody involved. Um, but I'm also not aware as to what uh, someone in, in your position, what, what rights do they have when quite clearly the, you know, the injustice that, that, that's been, uh, you know... Um, brought against you takes place. Did you ever consider or do you have well, any capacity I, to bring any sort of court action against I, I, I'm I, For a lawyer, I'm very anti-litigation. Uh, and, and after all, if, I, if, if I'm going to be involved in litigation, I might as well be one of the barristers at the bar table making a quid out of it. Uh, I, 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 one of the problems with... T I, I was very fortunate to be able to bring ICAC to a stop when I did and, and uh, the... the Court of Appeal uh, went with me, and so did the High Court. Uh, because Can I just interrupt you there? What's really telling too is the Court of Appeal upheld Margaret's case. It was ICAC who insisted on being gluttons for punishment and went to the High Court where they were beaten again. Yes. But they were so arrogant that they weren't, wouldn't give up. Yes, it's often said, oh, I had to go all the way to the High Court. Well, I did have to go, but... ICAC was the ones who decided to take it there, and they were their 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 behinds were tanned <laughs> even worse by the High Court than the, this State Court, where all you know where they all know each other uh, had done. And, and um, but but after that, there was a wicked thing called the uh, ICAC Validation Act. Retrospective legislation was passed, which pretty well stopped 
anyone doing what I'd done or seeking any relief because it declared that all of ICAC's misfeasances were now legal. And that, that uh, there was no, no faster bill passed through the parliament yeah. than that overnight one night. And now oh, so, I have so many politicians to whom I've spoken have said, oh, look, no one explained it to us. And oh, Come on. <laughs> Uh, it, it, that was outrageous, but it's 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 probably stopped any actions. Anyway, I I I don't want to keep living all of that stuff, and 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 money can't, well, it, if you got any, wouldn't repay what happened to my my family. Because remember, it wasn't just me. My son, my eldest son Steve, and and that and his girlfriend Sophia. It was it was against the three of us, and the the high court case is the three of us. So that, and that's why I took the action. You know, if if it had just been aimed at me, I I would have just got, you know, run the gauntlet and and done my best, knowing that I was completely innocent. But I I was always so incensed that because of me, these two were they, they weren't public servants. They didn't know what ICAC was. They had never heard of it. And in fact, most people hadn't before this. And, and they, they'd never heard of it, but they were raided and they were saying, are you the police? No, they, they, we didn't know what it was about. So, uh, and so they had their phones and everything. Now, I didn't know what whether they'd been up to no good in any other direction. I'm, I'm not saying that I thought they would, but, uh, but, but they, who knows what young people send uh, strange photos or whatever they do um, and every parent here knows knows about that why should they lose all their rights that, that every citizen has um, every other citizen um, who's not a public servant or a politician um, has has a right to silence has a right to to have things taken with them only by warrant so, so i i moved quickly to say to, to protect them from this this invasion that they they was, was no part of icac's business An amendment to the Crimes Act changing the law of sexual consent in New South Wales recently commenced. Do you have any particular view on that change to the law? I've deliberately not uh, looked at it terribly closely because I'm still running cases on the old law, so I don't really want to get mixed up. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, well, all it's going to mean is it's still going to be word against word. It's still going to be, well, I, I did ask. No, you didn't. It's, it's just another layer of things that they'll... It, 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 it doesn't really help. Uh, maybe what they, what they meant to do was to educate everyone with making sure that there was always consent. And, and perhaps that sh should have been tried in the first instance. Uh, this is just going to lengthen cases and, and I, I guarantee you the... the, the, the vast bulk of the cases that I'm seeing in this in this area are men of, of absolutely unblemished character and with very, very good defence cases, uh, dealing with, with, with young women who, uh, who might have drunk too much or might have uh, told a very different story to their girlfriends the next day and then girlfriends will get on the bandwagon and say, oh, that, oh, that must be, I'll take you to the hospital, I'll take you to the police, and, and this train takes off and, this, and, and parents have to mortgage their houses to get these boys represented. It, it's, so we're seeing before the courts um, a, a genre of young man who never would have been before any court before in, in the history of mankind. It looks like a... Uh, a move to criminalise uh, a, a greater range of people. And uh, it's, so it's just going to be longer trials, more arg more legal arguments, and so whereas it might now cost you um, $200,000 to be to be uh, to get justice after a false complaint of sexual assault, it'll cost you 400000 with the new laws. Or your parents. Yeah, your parents, yeah. And well, that doesn't all go to me, the solicitors yeah, take most of it. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. No, no. Oh, sorry. No, no. Okay. Um, Margaret, you were part of the Folbig case. Were you... Did uh, you oh, well... Were you prosecuting la, uh, that? A couple of years... No, no, I didn't prosecute it. Mark Tedeschi did. Do you have any did. opinions on it? Because it's interesting that it constantly seems to be getting attention. Yes. Can I, you comment I did on, on why you think that? I, I represented uh, 
Mrs. Folbig's former husband in the in the inquiry conducted by Justice Reg Blanche about two or three years ago, and I um, was I, I got to cross examine Mrs. Folbig, uh, and uh, she's never been cross examined before, and I had her diaries, and the cross examination um, was. Uh, uh, pretty probative of, of a number of things. So, so what we must bear in mind that um, even though I, I think two of her children had some sort of some perhaps some arguable genetic predisposition to cop death, two didn't. Um, they're, they're, these diaries were very uh, very damning. Uh, she she uh, so, and. She, and uh, I was fairly proud of my cross-examination. And I was representing uh, the undeniable victim, the man whose four children had been killed. When he, and he was, there's no, no uh, a suspicion attaching to him whatsoever, uh, he, because he wasn't there uh, on many of the times, on most of the times. One child was, was attacked twice. Uh, and wasn't, didn't die the first time, but was blinded and, uh, um, became a, um, a um, um, disabled, but then <clears throat> not long after that uh, he died. Um, so, so I, I have a, I do have a particular view about it, and it's and science is not going to answer it. And I, and some of the arrogance of the scientists that come forward and say, oh well, it, it's it's curious the the uh, what's happened because of course it went to the high court in the first place, and Justice Blanche said, well. I, um, this it's all it's gone through every appeal thing, but after the cross examination of um, Mrs. Folbig, her guilt is even more. Uh, I'm more sure of her guilt than before. So, I, so I, that's what I think, and I think it's very, very cruel um, and very difficult for Mr. Folbig to have to go through all of this and his family to go through all of this again. Okay, Jonathan. Does a professional lifetime prosecuting and defending sexual assault cases take a toll? And if so, what sort of toll has it taken? Um, uh, uh, while I was a parent of young children, I was always thinking that someone was going to get them. So I was very suspicious of people. Um, and um, I, But, but I, I don't know what I'd be like without that, that history of... To, of prosecuting and defending terrible crimes, not just sexual assault, but uh, murders. I, somehow I was, I've always pretty much done cases of personal violence, sexual assault, murders and serious assaults because um, I was always briefed in those because it, it was a, um, sort of a, a caring thing because I, I've always been accused of getting too close to the complainants or the bereaved relatives and now that I get... I probably get too. I'm thought to get too close to my own um, my own clients. It's it's interesting how how very similar it is too to be working with people that I think are that shouldn't be before the justice system. So it's it hasn't been much of a change, but it's it's good for you to, to give. I I think it's been good for me to give, and maybe my sense of humour is very warped and very black. And uh, maybe I drink too much beer to cope with it all, but I might have always drunk too much beer anyway. I'm not going to say anything about that, but uh, just if I can make one point on this. My very first interview with Margaret in her chambers, now as a defence barrister, I asked her what it was um, that connected the two worlds. And she said something to me which just really made sense. As a prosecutor, she felt empathy towards the victims. As a defence barrister, she feels empathy towards the accused. So she's living on empathy. You know, that's that's her drug. Yeah. I like people. I, I love people. But, gee, there's quite a few people, Most who, people. who hate me. <laughs> In light of the media, social media, and, as you say, the extraordinary commentary we sometimes get from the legal profession representing people, after 800 years, will we end up with just judge alone trials? Well, um, I, I hope not. I hope not. I, I'm a great believer in juries. I think they're very smart. And, and, and 12, 12 jurors have got to be a lot smarter than one um, 
one judge. Of course. And they've got much more life experience and much more wisdom. And they're, they're very... Um, and, and remember, our, our society is um, very diverse now. And it's, it's actually very uplifting to see the diversity in juries. I've got a jury right at the moment. Very diverse um, racially and, of course, uh, in, in every way. Uh, that, and that's great. That's it's the it's the connection with the community. It's keeping the community, because remember, judges are, judges are subject to uh, um, what would they call it? Professional development, uh, in which they are um, they are told and uh, of what they what we now all think in the community about particular crimes, in particular the sexual assault area. So. It's a, it's, a, it's a brave judge to go against that uh, tide, uh, really. But the community will pull it back. The community has, uh, have, has sons and brothers and fathers and, uh, and they know what goes on in life. And uh, t 12 jurors will always outsmart a single judge. I've got to be very quick now. We don't use this question there. Yeah, be quick, yeah. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Ella. It's lovely to see you. <laughs> yes. Robin. Yes, is this on? Can yes. You yes. It's, right. it's great Sorry, to see you, Robin. To... <laughs> Robin was was a a spectator in, in the case oh, I was I proudest of. Been on for a year. Good heavens. Anyway, you were brilliant. Uh, sadly, it went the other way eventually. Yeah. But Judges. Anyway, never mind. That, that was the case that was being stuffed up by yeah. the boss. Anyway, yeah. oh. anyway look, back to ICANN. Uh, considering what you went through, considering that somebody in Victoria recently committed suicide as a result of their equivalent of ICANN, considering that Eddie O'B, etc., probably would have got found out anyway, and considering that most of the ICANN work seems to be politically in one direction, do we need ICAC? Would, 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 Certainly not. What would happen if we didn't have ICAC? Well, we, the state would save an awful lot of money and, uh, and some, some, a really large number of very decent people that I know wouldn't have had their lives trashed. Really decent people. Murray Keir, Michael Gallagher, Sharif yeah. Ghazal, Steve Pearce. I could go on and on and on. I really could, I, and I've befriended all of these people, and we we stand together against uh, this this Not to hideous mention a couple outfit. of premiers. Yes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, oh, poor poor uh, Gladys Berejiklian. Uh, with, oh, it all had to be done so quickly. They couldn't wait for two weeks while she delivered us from from the the, the nonsense COVID business. And she, but they took her glory away because it had to be done then. And now, where's where's the report? report? Eight months later, nothing. It's, it, it's, it, what, why are we putting up with it? We've got two last questions. There's one here and one there. Okay, go be quick. Maybe Cole Comfort, but me and my friends thought the hit job that I can't did on you, and that was obviously a setup after that car accident. Small comfort. I agree with Chris Merritt. I have absolutely no faith in ICAC now, and that disgusting legislation, the validation bill, is an absolute shame on the big government. It is. And I wish you well in the future, and that, and uh, let's Thank hope you, sir. Uh, we never see the likes of this. Infamy again. Thank you very much, Leon. Okay, there's a question, Jay. Yeah. Other than, other than my despair about the legal side, I don't have any non lawyer here, but what is, if, if you were in charge of a massive reform, or one that may start small but may impact for the community's benefit, what reform could you bring to, to the judicial system? And I know this would be, you know, three hours we've got in time. I, I can think of a simple, a simple one, because I, I've been thinking about this with all the clients I've got. There's, some, there's quite a few hung juries, and maybe the more diverse juries get, the more hung juries there'll be. That's very unfair on people who are tried, because then they have to find the same amount of money for, for a, tro a, a jury again. So, yes, they do. And, and similarly, if a court of appeal criminal appeal gives people a retrial on the basis that, it, that a judge has got the directions wrong. They have to, it's, it's through no fault of their own, they've got to come up with the money for another trial. So, so, so if, if people were given 
if there's a, um, a hung jury, maybe the DPP should have to cough up the money for the uh, for the accused person, so that they don't have to pay a sec pay for a trial that didn't finish. Or if the courts have to pay when the judge gets it wrong, perhaps these that they'll be more careful. Perhaps perhaps the DPP will not be putting for, put to trial cases that are so weak that the that the jury can't agree. So, um, so in final comments. Um, uh, well, we start with um, we start with Andrew. What are you up to next? And Margaret, what are you up to next? Are you writing books, <laughs> giving speeches. What yes. Well, uh, there is. Uh, we just spoke about Gladys very quickly, and and that's my next book, which is okay. basically ready to go. Except I'm waiting for ICAC to issue its. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, you know. <laughs> So she didn't we, participate, but she knows that it's there. So we expect a late publication date. <laughs> <laughs> and Margaret Kinane, what are you up to next? I'm still enjoying. I've got, I'm booked out till um, middle of next year. I've got some good cases coming up, deserving cases, and I'll keep working hard for my client, which is which is, is a great burden in many ways. But it's very simple when you're only working for one person. <laughs> So many thanks to Margaret Kinane and uh, Andrew Urban for a lively presentation tonight. And as uh, Andrew was mentioning, there are so many cases, um, real cases dealt with in this book from the prosecution side, from the defence side, as long with speeches and um, other valuable insights. So it's a, it's a great compilation and it's for sale tonight. Uh, and Anne will sell other books uh, online when uh, when we put this up on our on our website. But for tonight, thanks to both of you, and well done, well done, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Thanks, folks.